All right. Um, so yeah, like Charlotte, I also thought about, you know, what do I want to do in my last lecture? And so one thing I want to do is wrap up this discussion of, you know, how we go from modular forms to Galois representations. And one reason I'm excited about this is that it actually gives me a chance to talk about my favorite uh, part of the math that I do, which is has to do with the geometry of modular curves. Um, and then afterwards, I want to come back to this notion of modularity and kind of give you some sense of, you know, once you have one direction in the Langley's correspondence, how do you go about for constructing the other direction? How do you actually prove a modularity result? Um, how was the modularity of rational elliptic curves proved? So that's the second uh, second topic. And then at the end, I'll try to give you some idea of kind of what's going on in the field today in terms of both geometry and arithmetic. All right, so the first thing is we want to go from a modular form F, and we have this one that we were viewing on K1N uh, with some trivial character because it's really a K naught. That's the kind of cusp form that corresponds to an elliptic curve. And we want to go from this to a Galois representation. And um, the way that we were doing it was first we noticed there is a number field, finite extension of Q, that contains the Fourier coefficients uh, or Hecke eigenvalues of S. This is the eigenform. And we're looking at the Hecke eigenvalues of that inside this number field. And then lambda is just a prime of the number field. And it's above some rational prime. Okay. And then, well, last time we actually constructed this rho f lambda. So this is a representation of the absolute Galois group of Q. And it's valued. Well, the way that we did it, it was valued inside QL bar a priori. So we don't quite know that it lands in KF lambda. However, but well, we expect it to factor through. And we know we have a natural way of seeing this KF lambda in here. Okay, so there is a Galois representation. And what we want to do is kind of really pin it down and connect it to F. And the Kind of the really key relationship that we need to establish is that so if p is now a different prime that doesn't divide n times l then we want to know that rho f lambda restricted to the decomposition group at p is unramified and so it's just given by one matrix is given by what it does to the Frobenian element at this prime P. And uh, the characterizing thing is that the determinant of X minus rho F lambda of the Frobenian set P should be, so the characteristic polynomial of this two by two matrix should be X squared minus APX plus P. And one secret thing is that once we've established this, again, this Chebotarev density theorem and the fact that we're pinning down the traces of these matrices, and these traces, remember, are elements in the number field Kf, that's going to tell us that this representation factors uh, as we want it to factor. So afterwards, it's just kind of a, a bit of linear algebra representation theory to conclude from this um, and from the Chebotara density theorem that this factors as desired. So if we establish this, we get that rho f lambda lands in GL2, not quite Kf, because it's a density, so we really have to look at the completion at lambda. It's an 
L-adic field. It's not just this finite extension of the rational numbers, but we get that this um, for free. Okay, so we're kind of done. We only have to establish one thing, which is this relationship. And this is the part where the geometry really comes in. So how do we construct rho and lambda was constructed essentially by looking at H1 et al of a modular curve at this level, really thought of as an algebraic variety defined over the rational numbers. Um, and to get a tall homology, what you have to do is you have to extend your coefficients to Q bar, to an algebraic closure of Q, and then suddenly you see all these Galois symmetries. So we were looking at this, and we were picking out from this big vector space the piece that knows about the modular form F. And the way that we were doing this is by picking out the system of Hecke eigenvalues. So really using the fact that our F is an eigenform. So where F, MF inside here is, so inside the big heck algebra that acts on anything, on everything, is um, the system of Hecke eigenvalues corresponding to F. Okay, um, so we're really in a setting where we're looking at an algebraic variety and, and we want to understand its cohomology in some sense. The fact that we have a tall cohomology gives us a Galois representation. The eichler shimura isomorphism tells us that if we start out with a cusp form that's an Eisen form, then this space is two-dimensional, so it's looking good, but we need to understand what happens when we now want to restrict the decomposition group at a prime P. And this prime P is a nice prime because it doesn't divide either the level of the modular curve. So we have a nice smooth modular curve, even over ZP. And it doesn't divide the coefficients here, the, the kind of the characteristic of the residue field in here. So we look at the kind of the last step to establish star we're going to do geometry over ZP. We look at S K1N, right, which is a priori defined over Z with N inverted. And we just think about it over ZP, the ring of p adic integers. And as a geometric object, this is relatively simple because it has two points. The points are sort of the, the two um, residue fields that you see when, when you look at um, prime ideals in here. So there's spec QP, right? So to draw spec CP, I have to just draw the two points. And there's a really fat point that is spec QP. And then there's, uh, this is an open one. And then there's a closed point that's the spectrum of the residue field. Okay. And our modular curve is integral. So you can think of it as a family over here. All right. And we're trying to understand kind of the Hecke correspondence. Um, a priori, we want to understand it over here, but it turns out that it's a lot better to just work um, over the special fiber that things simplify. So we have an isomorphism that is Hecke equivariant. Between, so what does it mean to restrict this big global Galois representation just to the decomposition group at P, so to the Galois group of a local field? Well, it means that we can start out with our variety and just go over here. Just restrict to QP bar. Um, so I'm looking at H1 et al. S K1N crossover QD bar. And with coefficients in QL bar, still have the Hecke algebra over there. So MF, this is a representation of G1 
GQP. And now the nice thing is because we have this nice integral model, and in fact, because we have a nice integral model, even of the compactification of the modular curve that you get by adjoining the cusps, there's an isomorphism between this and SK1N crossover FP bar, QL bar, MN. And remember that this, so this over here, over spec CP is smooth. And in fact, so the compactification, if I put the compactification here, then in fact, even this SK1N star over spec CP, this is smooth and projective. So the isomorphism essentially comes from um, a result uh, in a tall homology that's called, well, there's two results. There's one that's called proper base change that will apply to proper things and in particular to projective things. And there's a result called smooth base change that applies to smooth base. And so under those conditions, you can compare the cohomology of the generic fiber. So over this um, local field of characteristic zero, over QP bar, you can compare it to the cohomology of the special fiber, which is just over the residue field or over the algebraic closure of the residue field, this FP bar here. Okay. Um, and this is T equivariant and also it's GQP equivariant. And so this comes from smooth and proper base change. Um, and over here, I have GQP acting. But the funny thing is that once you're looking on the special fiber, the action is really, there's only one way that GQP can act on the atal homology of a variety over FP bar. Um, you know, th there's no action on the sheaf. This is just the constant sheaf and we have just a variety over FP bar. So the only way that this can act is an element of the Galois group of QP, the absolute Galois group of QP reduces and gives um, an element of the absolute Galois group of FP. So the only way that it can act is this way. And so the action over here factors over the absolute Galois group of the residue field. Um, and this is just the one that's generated by this Frobenius element. And so the action of inertia on this side is trivial. And that means we already have this result here. So this part is okay, simply because we have a model that is a smooth model um, over the entirety of spec CP. Um, and so we can use these base change results and we can reduce it to just the cohomology, understanding the cohomology of a smooth projective variety over um, FP bar. So the unramifiedness is okay, but then the next thing, so the thing that we have left to do is really connect. So over here, and a left to do is somehow connect the heck operator TP, right? Whose eigenvalue is AP to the Frobenius element inside this absolute Galois group, right value. So in order to characterize our Galois representations, we got to understand the traces at these Frobenius elements. And so we have to kind of understand how the Hecke correspondence over here interacts with the Frobenius uh, that comes from the fact that this is a priori a variety defined over FB, and then we're extending it over FB bar and seeing its symmetries. Um, and so the way that we do it is, well, we have to look at geometry and not just the geometry of this object here, which is smooth, 
projective. It's, you know, if I cover this up, it's alpine and smooth. In any case, it's pretty nice, just a, a nice smooth curve. But we have to understand the geometry of the Hecke correspondence. So to do the last step, we look at We study the geometry of the Hecke correspondence TP, right? So not as an operator on cohomology, but in a more kind of, uh, I don't know, primordial way, we want to think about it as just geometrically, what does it do to these spaces? And so even in this case of the modular curve, and we're just, we're looking at um, dimension one, and you might think everything is really simple, you still get a very beautiful and interesting picture. And so we have, I can do SK1 and here, but I have to intersect with K naught P, right? I have to go to a smaller level where I impose the extra congruence condition that my matrices have to be upper triangular modular P. And that's the space that's going to C that's going to allow us to access the Hecke correspondence. And we have a map P1 to back to SK1. And we have a map P2 back to SK1. And the Hecke correspondence on cohomology will amount to pulling back. So you look at the cohomology of this space, you pull it back to the cohomology of the bigger of the covering space. And then you take this kind of averaging, you take a trace map down to the original space. And then you've done something interesting. That's what TP does here. It's kind of similar to the averaging operator that you also saw in Charlottesville. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And we have a moduli interpretation. Ah, and let me say that all of this, I wanna think about it over FP. And I put this bar on top of the spaces to signify the fact that I'm looking at the special fiber. So instead of the whole integral model, I just really reduce modulo P, and these are the spaces that I get. Okay, and we had a moduli interpretation. So over here, we have an elliptic curve equipped with a point of exact order n, an n torsion point on the elliptic curve. Um, over here, we have the same data, but then an extra structure. We had a subgroup of order P of the P torsion of the elliptic curve. I guess in Alicia's talk, you saw a slightly different version of this where you had an isogeny from an E1 to an E2. That's the same thing because you can either encode an isogeny between the two elliptic curves, or you can encode the kernel of the isogeny. And that's what this subgroup C does is it remembers the kernel. Okay, and so this is just the forgetful map, but if I want to go this way, then this is E mod C and Q mod C. And that's how you see that moduli theoretically, the correspondence actually does something interesting. Okay, so now I'm kind of at the point where I want to draw a pretty picture. So. Let me write first. Already on the level of SK1N bar, so over the residue field, this has a stratification that is called the Newton stratification. So it turns out there are different kinds of elliptic curves mod P. Um, there are elliptic curves that are so-called ordinary, and there are elliptic curves that are super singular. And so those are going to be my two strata, SK1N bar ORD union SK1N bar SS for super singular. This is an open and dense stratum, and this is a finite set of Okay, and so what does it mean for an elliptic curve to be ordinary or super singular? It means that, well, if I look at an elliptic curve, say over Q or over C, and I look at the P torsion, 
then the p torsion subgroup has order p squared. That's just what it looks like. Say over C, you think of the one dimensional torus, you think what are the points that are gonna be sent to the origin under multiplication by P, and there's a Z mod PZ cross a Z mod PZ of them. So order P squared. But what's happening if you work modulo P is that sometimes some of these points stick together. In fact, they, they always, some of them always stick together. And um, it's essentially kind of like the structure of a non-reduced group scheme, if you know what that is. If you don't know what that is, you can just think about the fact that a piece power root of unity modulo P is just, well, it just is just congruent to one mod P, so it just looks like one. You cannot tell apart the P power roots of unity when you look mod P. Um, the same kind of thing happens with the torsion points on the elliptic curve. You can't tell them apart always when you look mod P. But the ordinary ones are the ones that have more points, and the super singular ones are the ones that have really just one point. All the points get stuck together. So let me write this down. Well, if I look, if I look over C, then um, EP has P squared torsion points. The structure is just C mod PZ squared. So cross itself. There's kind of two directions in the lattice that you can look at. However, if E over FP is an elliptic curve, then the number of points, of torsion points on the elliptic curve that are valued in FP or even, uh, right, so this is less than or equal to one. So there are, there's always some points that are going to stick together, uh, but it can be, so the cardinality, ah, oh, sorry, e to the one, thank you. I'm always thinking, yes. And it's taking a logarithm. So it's either just one point or it's P points. Um, if the cardinality is equal to P, then E is called ordinary. And if the cardinality is equal to one, then E is called super singular. And you would just define this stratification at the level of points. So you can't just do this and say, you know, for any extension of SP, I have any field, algebraically closed field extension of SP. If I have a point defined over that, I look at the number of P torsion points. If, it, if there's P of them, I put that point in the ordinary stratum. If there's just one point, I put it in the super sing, I put that point in the super singular stratum. And that just, gives you a kind of open and closed stratification of the modular curve. And just as a motivating example, rather than thinking about the, right? If you haven't seen this before, you can think about the case of mu p. So this is just the, the group of p's roots of unity, but you can make this into a group scheme, if you will, and think about how many points does this have. So this only has, sort of this is a connected group scheme. Over um, FP or over FP bar, but if we think about it uh, over something of characteristic zero, then it's at all, the points are spread apart. So it has P uh, points, say over something like QP, 
or Chirpica. And so the P torsion points on the elliptic curve behave in a way kind of like this mu P, but in a more complicated way. So the reason that you have this inequality is that there's always an isogeny called the Frobenius isogeny. That goes from E to EP, where E is maybe given by some equation, and I'm allowed to um, kind of raise all the coefficients to the pth power, and I get a different elliptic curve. I get a twisted one by Frobenius, and there's always an isogeny like this, and this is always sort of or a multiplication by P by P on E factors through the Frobenius isogeny. And this is something that is purely inseparable. So that means for us that the kernel, and maybe I call this F, the kernel of F is a connected group. So this is over FP or over FP bar or any field of characteristic P. This is a connected group scheme. Right. So we have this phenomenon of points sticking together, and we have this stratification that tells us how much they stick together. Okay. So finally, I get to draw. So maybe I want to make my curve to begin with just white. So this is our SK1N bar. So this is all of it is over FP or over FP bar. Doesn't really matter which one I do. And so I just have super singular points. that are purple, right? This is all a moduli space of elliptic curves. And those elliptic curves that are super singular give me finitely many points. The rest of it, the open dense stratum that I get by removing them is the ordinary stratum. Okay, and so the reason I drew it here is that something really interesting happens when you look at level K naught P. And I said, this is no longer smooth, it's actually no longer smooth exactly over spec CP, and it's exactly the, the special fiber mod P where you see the singularities. And that comes from the moduli problem, kind of finding a subgroup inside the P torsion. You could imagine that that is something that, you know, could be different if you're looking at an ordinary elliptic curve versus if you're looking at a super singular one. And so this has two components, it turns out, like this. One component and another one is like this. And they exactly, so each component just looks like a copy of um, the original SK1N at level prime to P. But when you go to this level, so this would be SK1N intersect K naught P bar. That's this higher level. And let's say this is my map P1. So there's two components. Each of them look like a copy of this. And then the components intersect precisely at the finitely many super singular points. And this, this thing that I'm drawing now is called the Deline Rappaport model um, for the modular curve at level K naught P. So there's another thing. So, okay, this is what it looks like. You can prove this by studying the moduli problem. I'm not going to do it right now, but I want to tell you it's not just interesting what it looks like, but it's interesting what the maps are. The, for instance, what P1 does when you project back, when you forget the extra structure and you go back um, to level prime to P. So this one, the red component, um, I'm going to say that the red component is the component where this C, ah, Okay, sorry. So the, the purple ones are the super singular points. So those just get sent points to points. 
I have to draw another one over here. And now on the ordinary locus, what's happening is, so if E say over F E bar is ordinary, then it's not just that it has um, P torsion points uh, of order P, precisely P, but it's also that you can describe a structure of EP as a group scheme as mu P cross Z mod P scheme. So this one is the multiplicative one. So this is an isomorphism of group schemes. So schemes, but with a group structure over FP bar. So there's a part that looks like the piece power roots of unity, and there's a part that looks at all. So just P points that don't touch, don't know about each other. There's a group structure, the group structure on Z mod P. And so the red component amounts, if you look at the red component on the ordinary locus, you have to pick what your subgroup of order P would be. Um, and so, well, you can choose either this or this. And it turns out that if you choose mu P, um, so we're looking at the red component where C is equal to mu P, then it turns out that P1 becomes an isomorphism. So the reason for that is kind of over a point, if you look at an ordinary elliptic curve, the P torsion has this structure. But when you try to look at it in families, so not over a point, but over a curve, so over one dimensional base, then it doesn't look so simple, just a product of two things. Um, but say over, so if you want, this is the version over points, and the version in families is over S K one N ORD bar ORD, the universal elliptic curve. I can look at its P torsion, and it no longer just breaks up as a product, but it has kind of a universal mu P as a sub object, and it has a universal C mod P Z as a quotient. But sort of because we're looking at the universal family, there are non-trivial extensions of this at all thing by this multiplicative thing. And the fact that there are non-trivial extensions, and this is the universal family, means that the universal family has to be such a non-trivial extension, because it has to see kind of the most complicated thing that you can realize. Um, and so that means kind of in a family, if you want to choose some subgroup uniformly and you choose mu p, this is already a subgroup. So that's why this map over here is an isomorphism. But then if you look at the blue component, the blue component is the one where c is z mod p z. And this is not something uh, that you can do so easily in a family, kind of make it, sort of pick it out as a subgroup of the p torsion when you work in families. What happens is, if you're going to pick this one out, you have to find a way to split this extension. And that's kind of a, something that really, you know, messes with the geometry of your object. What it amounts to is you kind of have to take a piece power root of the coordinate over here. So here I have some coordinate, like this could be, you could think of it as SPX. And the only way to split this extension when you work in a family is to go over fp x1 on p. You have to take a piece power root. And so this map back down is the one that raises to the piece power. It's called the relative Frobenius. So I'll call it s sub s k 1 n, the relative Frobenius. OK, um, so that's that's the geometry. And that's what I kind of a picture that I really like. And you can ask, well, what happens if you look at P2? And this is also a really nice thing. If I want to describe the map P2, so I want to look what happens on this other side where I quotient out by the canonical subgroup. Um, I'll leave it as something for you to think about, but what happens is you flip it. So the red component gets mapped down by the relative Frobenius and the blue component gets mapped down by an isomorphism. So it has this really beautiful symmetry. 
Okay, and essentially, kind of the upshot is that you can understand the Hecke correspondence by just studying this picture moduli theoretically. Um, and maybe I'll just write it down. So if you analyze this um, P1 and P2 using the moduli interpretation, so we kind of uh, sort of using the moduli interpretation, of the Hecke correspondence. We can get that TP will send a pair EQ, so an elliptic curve, together with a point of exact order N. And let me make sure I don't get it the other way around. Um, so you get it to EP, and um, QP plus P times E, E inverse plus P times QP inverse. But so these two pieces come from the two components and you just have to think about what happens. So, you know, I start out with EQ here, and if I want to look at the red component, I have to go to E, Q, and mu P under, so if I pull it back under P1, and I look at the point on the red component that I see, that's what I do, and then I push it forward under P2, I have to quotient by mu P. This mu P is exactly the kernel. So this one is the kernel of the Frobenius isogeny. Frobenius isogeny going from E to E, P. So when I take the quotient by mu P, I go exactly here. And then the other thing you get kind of gets reversed and this P shows up here um, because uh, of this degree P map, that's the relative Frobenius, that's a map that's purely inseparable, but it has degree P. So locally it just extracts a P power root of your coordinate. Okay, so this allows you to really uh, connect um, the Hecke correspondence, so I could rewrite this as saying that TP is F plus something like PF inverse, and then sort of rewrite as, and then this becomes equivalent to F squared minus TP uh, F plus P equals zero. And of course, this is a relative Frobenius, so this F here would be F on this A1. Um, and you still have to connect the relative Frobenius on this space with the kind of arithmetic Frobenius that's in the Galois group, but that's something that's easier, a little bit easier to do. Um, so that's where this last relationship comes from. What you see here is called the eichler shimura relation. And I'm slightly cheating here because I'm only looking at the forms that come from level K naught N that have this trivial character. Otherwise, the fact that I'm multiplying this point by P might introduce a character at this point. So this is something called the eichler shimura relation, um, but sort of, it takes some work to really prove everything rigorously, but ultimately the idea is that you just have to understand the geometry of what happens when you go to this bigger level, K naught P, and then you project down in different ways back to your original level that was prime to P. Okay, are there questions about this? Yes. I, I'm very confused about, so like you multiply by P with C, but then you multiply P again for the Q, it seems like you're multiplying by P squared. So, so okay. here I'm thinking of them as divisors, right? And so this P just means in sort of, yeah, I should have said this, as divisors, we have this. Whereas, so on the P on the outside, that means I'm just taking P times that point as a divisor. Here, it just means that, well, remember, you have to look at Q mod C. And I'm just saying that if I quotient out by a certain C, that point that's exact order N gets multiplied by P. So it ends up going to a different point of exact order N, but it's not too far away from the original one. Other question? Yes. Um, so I wanted to check. So P2 is the relative for BNS, or is, which one is P2? <laughs> 
Not quite. So this is the description of P1. So the point is that this space here is not smooth. This space here has two components. And so even if I just look at P1, on each component, there will be something different that happens. P1 isn't boring. It's sort of boring on the red component, but interesting on the blue component. But that's just the map P1. So if I were to write down 2, I would do it with red and blue flipped. Somehow, the reason that this is not boring on the blue component is because when you try to choose this as your subgroup, but you try to do it in families, you still have to do something quite radical to the geometry of the space. Um, so maybe I'll just say this, that sort of, I have this thing here, and I have this, and I have this one, and if I were to write down P2, then this one would be the Frobenius. Ah, so not an isomorphism. This would, not, would be the relative Frobenius SK1 and bar. And this one would now be an isomorphism. The, the flipping is something called the Atkin Lehner involution. That's to do kind of, it's kind of connected to a file repellent. Any other questions about this? Okay. So maybe I feel like I've explained to you a lot about what to do with go to from modular form to Galois representation. And I sort of started out by saying, oh, you know, there's this really great result that's the modularity of elliptic curves. So maybe what I want to do now is go, so we've done a bit of geometry. Now I want to go to the side of arithmetic. Um, so we have F going to row F. Um, if you want, so let's assume now that F is in S2, K not N with coefficients in C, and let's assume that KF is Q. This is the kind of modular form that gives rise to an elliptic curve, that gets associated to an elliptic curve. And I have this compatible system of Galois representations attached to F that works for every prime L, right? And it's constructed like that, and we get its properties from studying the geometry and all that. So let's look at E over Q an elliptic curve. How can we prove that E is modular? There exists some F uh, such that rho FL is isomorphic to rho EL for every prime L. Right? So we're, I want to think back a bit about modularity. This was not, okay. This is as, as much as I can do at the moment. <laughs> And yeah, this is kind of one reason why I really like this area is that you get to do both geometry and number theory and sort of arithmetic. And this modularity result is proved in several steps. Um, and there is one step that really involves making use of congruences, modulo P, between modular forms. So the first step is to assume that you know some kind of modularity, that you have some, some kind of foothold into modularity, you assume that, so we have, well, let me recall that we have rho EP or rho EL going from GQ into GL2 QL, um, but it really factors through because it's constructed via the tape module it really factors through GL2 of ZL of the integers. 
And so it makes sense to think about this, just the reduction module L of the Galois representation. So you just reduce mod L. This is essentially just the, the Galois representation that you get by looking at um, the action of the Galois group on just the L torsion points on the elliptic curve. So you don't have to go all the way deep into the tape module. You just look at the L torsion points and you get this residual Galois representation. So you assume this um, has large image and you assume that it's modular, i.e. that there exists a modular form G, maybe, so in S2, K not N for some N, C, such that rho G L, I can also reduce this modulo L, and then I assume that I have an isomorphism, but just on, oh, E, I started out with E, just on the level of the residual Galois representations. So you start out by just assuming much less than what you want to prove. You want to prove kind of a statement for a ZL representation, so integrally, and you start out by just assuming that you have a connection mod L. And you assume that this has a large enough image. Then there is something called the taylor wiles method. Allows you to prove that um, E itself is modular. And this is quite a, a complicated thing that sort of the way that it goes is you look at kind of all the possible Fs that are congruent to this G and that kind of live in the same level. And you look at their Galois representations and you study that family and you try to match it with the family of all the Galois representations, including the ones that come from E. Um, so this kind of uses um, sort of this matches two families of Galois representations that deform the fixed residual one. Rho E L bar isomorphic to Rho G L bar. So one family coming from modular forms And then a more general family. Uh, so one family just, that's one sort of family that sees everything that should come from modular forms. So I'll just say one family containing rho EL. Okay, and it's quite a technical step and I'm not gonna go into details with it, but I will just say this, this step is called a modularity lifting theorem, because you start out assuming that you have some modularity, you have modularity mod L, and you're lifting this modularity to characteristic zero to ZL. This is called the modularity lifting theorem. And some of this, for instance, came up in some of the choices and techniques involved in proving this came up in Kalyani's talk. So one looks at deformation rings of Galois representations and studies their geometry. Okay, so that's step one. I wanna tell you step two is, well, you have to put yourself in a situation where your assumptions, you know, where you have this foothold, otherwise you can't do anything with step one. So step two, and I guess this, yeah, shows up in, essentially in Wiles' paper on the uh, modularity of semi-stable elliptic curves, is that for a special prime L, you can get this residual modularity, you can get this foothold. 
So step two is residual modularity for L equal to three. So it turns out if you, if you take the prime L equals three, then GL2 F3, this is uh, solvable. And you can embed it into GL2C. Uh, well, it's not, so not every solvable group does that, but this one does. It can be embedded into GL2C. And then one uses an analytic technique from the Langlands program. There's a theorem of Langlands and Tunnel that will produce for you a modular form if um, you start out with something in GL2C that has solvable image. So use Langland's tunnel theorem and really a lot of trace formula and very complicated and advanced analytic techniques show up here um, to produce a modular form G, except I'll call it G prime because it's not the one that you want. So the problem is that what you see, you end up seeing a representation with finite solvable image. The kind of modular form that corresponds to this is not a weight to one. It's a weight one modular form. So that's the trick. It's this is weight one. Um, so then you need to work a bit harder and you have to produce a congruence from G primed to a form of weight two. mod three, uh, where now this is a modular form of weight two. So congruence has come up again in this step as well, but yeah, I guess one thing I really think is cool about this area is, so you have this really hard analysis, this theorem of Langlands and Tunnel, and then you use some congruences, and these congruences are produced using the geometry of modular curves, something called the Hasse invariant. Okay, so steps one and two together kind of give you something. Because, well, you have to assume that this rho bar EL has large image. But if it has large image, if so, if steps one and two together, if rho bar E3 has large image, then E is modular, right? Step two will give you residual modularity, and step one will give you the modularity lifting theorem. And so you're just assuming that the Galois action on the three torsion is large enough. Yeah, did someone have a question? Okay, um, so that's good, but it doesn't cover all elliptic curves, right? Because that could be what we do about the ones where this is really small image where maybe there's a line in the three torsion that's stable under the whole Galois action. And so the image is kind of upper triangular that's typically small. Um, so that's another really clever thing. And that really exploits the fact that when you have a modular form, you don't just have one Galois representation. You have a whole compatible system of them. And you have a whole range of choices of primes L. So step three is a really clever step. It's called modularity switching. It's called the three five modularity switch. So you assume that rho bar E3 has small image for whatever that means. So the opposite of large, <laughs> but Rho bar E5 has large image. So then, well, if you knew this one was modular, then you could apply step one, you could apply your modularity lifting theorem, and then you'd be in good shape. But how do we prove that this is modular? Right? It's, this is um, GL2 of F5 is not solvable. It's very, very closely connected to the icosahedral group. Too. A5, so it's not solvable. We can't just apply this kind of theorem in here. So then what one does is one finds an auxiliary curve 
e primed over q an elliptic curve such that rho bar e primed five is isomorphic to rho bar e five and rho bar e primed three has large image. So if you can do this, then steps one and two will tell you e primed is modular. And then, well, it's modular, like it works for any prime. And so in particular, this representation here is residually modular at five. And so that means this is residually modular. And then this, these two steps together tell you that the original curve is also modular. So how do you find such an e-primed? Well, as it turns out, such e-primes are parameterized by rational points on a twist of the modular curve with full level five. So the modular uh, curve with level gamma five structure where you're kind of rigidifying the entire five torsion on your moduli problem. And so this thing has a rational point because sort of the, it's a twist, but E is a point on this twist. So it does have one rational point, E as a Q point. And it has genus two. And so that tells you that this is just P1. And there's lots and lots of rational points on P1. This condition of large image just takes out a really small piece of it. It takes out a thin subset. Um, so kind of large image condition, you just avoid something called a thin subset. So you can find lots and lots of rational points that have the right property. Okay, so you find your E prime, you know it's modular by the previous steps, and then you deduce that E is modular. So you're just left with one step. Which is, well, what if the Galois representation on the three torsion and on the five torsion is small. What do you do then? Step four, you assume that rho bar E3 and rho bar E5 have small image. Or whatever that is, the opposite of large. Well, then it turns out these are enough conditions to really exclude only very few curves. So these are kind of the, these correspond to Q points on some small modular curves or modular curves with small level. For example, on to use the notation I've been using, these correspond to points on X of K naught 15. You impose a condition at three of small image and a condition at five of small image. So you kind of impose a congruence condition mod 15, and you've got to look at the rational points here. Turns out there's only four of them. So this cardinality is four, and these can be understood computationally. So, you know, there's like, there's geometry, there's hard analysis, there's things with congruences. Um, there's like just very clever arguments. There's computation. So there's a lot that goes into proving this kind of theorem. And so I'm going to just take one more minute to tell you about sort of what's happened since. So one thing that happened is People were able, as I mentioned in the first talk, to um, extend this theorem to elliptic curves defined over real quadratic fields. And that involved a lot of uh, progress on step one. 
the technology in step one was clarified, became more conceptual. Um, it also involved much harder computations, and it involved an additional switch where if one really needed to use the prime seven. So you couldn't get away with just three and five, but you really had to make use of seven as well. Um, now, I also want to say what happened in the um, imaginary quadratic case. So the technology in step one had to be kind of expanded in some way to incorporate the fact that in the imaginary quadratic case, you're working with spaces that are Yankee manifolds, so arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds rather than modular curves. And so there was work of Caligari Garrity um, that helped deal with this phenomenon uh, and work of Schulze that helped produce the Galois representations that were needed, these kinds of compatible systems that were needed that worked um, in the generality that was required for these arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds. So there was that. Um, there was work of myself and Schulze on periodic geometry uh, that was needed to understand the properties of these Galois representations. And that really involved doing geometry on higher dimensional Shimura varieties and really using like the theory of perfectoid spaces and a lot of recent developments. There was a 10 author paper that was written uh, at the IES that kind of put things together to prove a potential version of modularity. Um, then there was something really clever done to, and hard and technical done to deal with step two in that setting. That was due to work of Alan, Kara, and Thorne because it turns out that producing congruences when you work with arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds is a lot harder than produces, producing congruences when you work with modular forms and modular curves. And then, uh, right, there was this result um, of me and James Newton where we were able to put things together and prove modularity, for instance, over uh, the Gaussian numbers Q adjoin I. But the thing that we couldn't do is we could have a three five switch, but we could not make the three seven switch work. So if, if somebody could make that three seven switch work in our setting, they would get a better theorem. Um, and yeah, so there's there's open problems and things to do. And thanks very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Yeah. I guess I have a question about what does really large and small image mean? Well, I think in this today, you can do it with just saying that the image is contained in the Borel. But well, depending on your setting, you might want to say, for instance, you want to exclude image contained in the Borel or image contained in a split Carton subgroup or image or, or a normalizer of a split Carton or maybe a normalizer of a non-split Carton. So there are some very specific subgroups of GL2FP that you need to exclude, and then pretty much everything else will work. Yeah. I'm not sure if you already said this, but for uh, the Taylor and Wiles group, where does the semi-stable <laughs> Um, That had to do somehow with, so there's this like general machinery that's Taylor Wiles patching, but at the time when this was done, it wasn't that well developed. And so for instance, they were working with some deformation rings of Galois representations that were as simple as possible. For example, just smooth dimension one. And as soon as you, you start seeing some, some you know, harder conditions at the prime L, so if you're doing, you know, con you have congruences and you have a residual thing mod L and you try to lift to characteristic zero, then the prime L is really key. Um, if you have harder conditions there, the deformation ring at L becomes more complicated and it just took more time um, to kind of figure out how to go around this. And so there was work of Kissin that really put the Taylor Wiles method in a much more conceptual framework. And then there was also the Piatic Langlands program that Kaliani talked about that kind of developed it from another uh, perspective. And so I guess, yeah, the, 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 those were some things that kind of needed to be done to go from semi stable to general. Any other questions? If, yeah. Is the picture of for Heka correspondences for abelian varieties is it as nice and explicit as you showed us today, or is it a mess? Um, so that's a great question. Um, there are some beautiful things that happen in higher dimensions, but they also get much more complicated. So there's a lot more strata. 
Yeah. Uh, but actually, so I, I wanted to, for instance, seeing Lee, right? She, she has worked on kind of the eichler shimura relation for much more general Shimura varieties. And she's understood something that, yeah, but people before couldn't make this eichler shimura relation work in certain settings. So you should go and talk to her. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Well, uh, this brings the, um, the week to a close, uh, the lecture part of the week. Um, we'll take a short break and then uh, we will talk to you about the ambassador program. Let's, uh, let's thank Anna and all the speakers.